Welcome to the August 2019 SNOC webinar, Storing More Carbon in Your Soil by Susan Orgle, brought to you by the New South Wales DPI Soils Unit. So having done that, I'd, like, I'd now like to introduce Susan Orgle, who's presenting today's webinar. Susan has been with New South Wales DPI since 2005, working on a range of soil health projects since then. From 2012, she's worked as a researcher with the Soils Unit with a current focus on management strategies to increase soil carbon. Susan's interested in carbon fractionation, subsoil carbon sequestration, and the management of pastures to increase soil organic matter. And probably many of you have come across Susan giving talks around the countryside, including at the, at the um, Carbon Farming Conference in Orbit this, this week. And also with Susan's young family, she also manages a menagerie of animals in her home, including chooks, snakes, insects, and lizards. And just a correction, okay. I was there purely as an observer at the Carbon Farmers Conference this week in Albury to hear about all the fantastic things going on, not as a presenter. Okay, thank you everyone for um, joining the webinar this afternoon. I'm very excited to be talking to you about soil carbon sequestration. I wanted to start today's presentation with a bit of a story about my journey into soil carbon science. Um, so my, I started with the department almost 15 years ago and I was running a range of soil health workshops around the countryside and it was very much based on a recipe. You've got your soil and your plants and you can pour on some nutrients and you sow the right plants and you can get some great production outcomes and they were really successful pro, um, workshops but consistently I had farmers asking me about two things. First of all, about soil organic matter, and this is 15 years ago. So what can we do to increase soil organic matter? What do we know about soil carbon sequestration? And secondly, about the life engine in our soil, so the soil microbes. And they were two consistent things that led me on my soil carbon journey, which was to start my PhD, um, looking at farm management strategies to increase soil carbon. And my research sites were on the Monero region in the Monero region. And I was looking at grazing management practices, nutrient applications. And throughout that, I saw the really important effects of parent material and climate on soil carbon stocks, but also the opportunities to use our management as levers to increase soil carbon sequestration. And for those of you familiar with some of the beautiful soils of the Monero, they're, they look so good you could almost eat them. So now what you're seeing on your screen is my one of my pieces of sequestered carbon, Rupert Orgill, my son, holding a piece of soil that represents the combination of everything I spoke about. It's parent material, the climate, the pastures, the nutrients, and really important, the soil microorganisms. Abby, when I was putting together this presentation, mentioned that we could talk about the myths. And I was thinking, what is the number one myth about soil carbon sequestration? And <laughs> the myth that came to the top of my mind was that we actually don't know everything. There's lots of things we don't know about increasing soil carbon. And in particular, there's lots of exciting new advances in practices, in machinery that farmers are seeing on their farm. And the challenge for us as scientists is to ask the right questions and to come up with some important evidence-based answers. And there'll be some of the things that I'll be talking about today. But undeniably, what we do know is that there's a really important solution to climate change under our feet, and that's in using soil carbon sequestration to mitigate some of the effects of climate change. And as land managers, we've got that really important role, and there are a huge amount of public good benefits from privately managed agricultural land. So let's start our learning journey for this Friday afternoon. And I know online we've got a people from a range of different backgrounds, but I wanna start the journey together, this learning journey about soil carbon sequestration. And let's start by thinking about the way that soil carbon is actually built. So soil carbon flows around our landscapes every day. Through, the, through photosynthesis, plants that we grow, so all of those green solar panels that you're seeing on your screen at the moment, use sunlight, carbon dioxide and water 
to grow. And this is really important for producers, obviously, because this is what we make money out of. Now that carbon dioxide goes from a gas into a liquid in the plant in terms of glucose and a whole lot of other carbon-based um, compounds and also into the plant structure itself. So the cellulose and the plant roots. So we've got the above ground organic matter that we can see, the leaves and the litter and the manure that gets left on the soil surface. And then we've got the below ground contribution of organic matter to the soil in terms of the roots. And with our grazing management, this is a really important way of contributing organic matter to the soil. But also importantly is through root exudates. So the carbohydrates and the carbon rich liquids that leak out of our plant roots to feed microorganisms. Now, the reason the plants do that is to attract the organisms to come and live close to them because we know through that association, plants have a better acquisition of nutrients. They can even alter the pH within the rhizosphere. So that's a really important component of what we're managing in this system here. So we've got our above ground livestock, if we're a livestock producer, but Every single farmer also has um, microscopic livestock below ground as well. And this all combines into the pool, which we refer to as soil organic matter. Now, once organic matter gets in the soil, there's a range of different pathways it can follow. We can have fresh organic matter that gets wrapped up nice and tightly in aggregates or soil crumbs. And depending on where that is in the soil profile, that can be protected from further decomposition and is a really important store of organic matter in the soil. And there's been some studies to show that fresh organic matter tightly wrapped up in a nice stable soil crumb can stay in the soil for up to 40 years. Now, as a soil scientist, when I collect the soil sample and I take it back to the lab and we dry that sample and then we crush it and we sieve it, we're exposing that organic matter. So we're actually saying, well, that was label organic matter. But we all know that if it was remained wrapped up in a nice stable aggregate, under a nice perennial pasture, that organic matter was sequestered carbon that could have stayed there for decades. So aggregation is a really important way of protecting organic matter in the soil. And we influence that with our land management. Now this soil organic matter is also decomposed by microbes. Now this is what I refer to as functional organic matter. It's really important. Nearly all of our plant available nutrients need to pass through microbes to become plant available. So our farming systems actually depend on this process of microbes consuming organic matter and that makes humus, um, but they also respire. That's a really important process, that microbial pool of organic matter. Now, as I said, these microbes respire just like plants do too. But very excitingly, microbes, not only do they supply the nutrients for the soil and they can enhance soil structure, but they also stabilize organic matter, which further protects it from further decomposition. And that's in the form of humus. Now our microbes and our microbial products and humus can become chemically protected within complexes of clays that are in the soil. And different types of clays have different abilities and strength that holding onto that organic carbon. Now the flow of carbon doesn't necessarily stop there because we can also have carbon loss from the system in terms of carbon that's transported off site. And in extreme wind erosion events, this carbon might go as far as New Zealand. So that's an important process that we can straight away stop by having good ground cover and retaining carbon in situ. What we want is label carbon that's feeding our microbes and supplying nutrients for our plants. We want chemically protected organic carbon that's going to help us in mitigating climate change. And it's also going to enhance the soil's ability to store and hold on to nutrients as well as water. So all of this organic matter pool can be represented by three carbon types. So there's charcoal and some of our Australian soils have up to 35% charcoal. So imagine what you see in your fireplace, but then it's microscopic charcoal from tens of thousands of years of burning of our landscape. And charcoal is a really important home for microbes. 
and it can contribute to some other soil properties, but it's not something that we readily influence with land management. Then you've got your particulate or your labile organic matter. Now that's the really tasty type of organic matter that's important for our microbes. Um, and that's like your cash flow if you're thinking about your production. That's where you get your nutrients from, where you've got the engine room, the fuel for the engine room of your soil microbes. And then you've got your humic pool, which I've just descri described before. Now, people often use the term soil organic matter and soil organic carbon interchangeably. As I've just described, soil organic matter is partially decomposed organic residues, it's microbes, it's humus and it's charcoal. When we talk about carbon, that's what we measure in soil organic matter. And we know that soil organic matter is approximately 58% carbon. Importantly, that means that the rest is made up of a whole heap of other, other nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur, which are really important for our plants and production systems, and a range of other trace elements as well. So before I go any further, I just want to talk about some terms that I'll use interchangeably as we move through this presentation. So first of all, SOC, soil organic carbon percentage, is what I refer to as the total organic carbon in the soil. It can be measured as a percentage or it might be reported as grams of carbon per 100 grams of soil. So they're the same thing. Uh, soil carbon stocks is what we report when we're looking at the mass of carbon, usually to 30 centimetres, and it's reported in tonnes of carbon per hectare. And then we've got carbon dioxide equivalents. So that's when we're talking internationally for carbon trading or looking at greenhouse gas inventories, everything comes back to carbon dioxide equivalents. So to go from one tonne of soil carbon to a tonne of carbon dioxide equivalents, we multiply it by 3.67. So why are we interested in soil carbon? We know there's a range of production benefits such as nutrient cycling, water infiltration, pasture and crop regeneration and growth. And these are really important in our systems. Soil organic matter is basically a sponge for water and nutrients, and that's what underpins our production systems. So specifically, um, we know that if you increase the amount of soil organic carbon, you increase the cation exchange capacity. So we'll just quickly sidestep and have a bit of a soil science 101 here. So carbon um, cation exchange capacity is the soil's ability to hold on to, store and exchange cations or nutrients. So I want you all now just to close your eyes and go to your special space and imagine that you're standing in front of a room full of people, okay? And that room full of people, they're all sitting on chairs. Now that room is what we represent as the soil. So you're in the soil now. Now those chairs are our exchange surfaces. So they're negatively charged spaces, which hold on to the nutrients. And all the people you see in that audience are the nutrients, they're calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and a range of other cations as well. Now, if we've got a soil that is high in clay, because our cation exchange capacity is driven by two things, the amount of clay in the soil and the amount of soil organic carbon. So a soil that is higher in clay can have more chairs in the room. A sandier soil, all of a sudden we're taking away, say, half the amount of chairs in that room, all of a sudden you've got half the audience standing. So you've got half of the nutrients now, which aren't attached to the soil, so they can be leached or lost from that system. Now, what we do when we're increasing the amount of soil organic carbon in terms of the cation exchange capacity of the soil is we're bringing in a whole heap more chairs. So you can hold on to more nutrients so they can be available for our plants to grow. And this can be quite extreme in our sandy soils. Up to 90% of the cation exchange capacity can be due to our amount, the soil organic carbon content. So it's very, very important. Now, soil organic carbon is also an important nutrient reservoir. So a 1% increase in soil organic carbon just in your top 10 centimetres can lead to an increase in two and a half tonnes of nitrogen per hectare. So that's a huge amount. It's important for phosphorus and sulphur. Most of the sulphur that your plants use come from that organic matter pool and through those microbes. 
And soil organic matter is also really important for water holding capacity. So not only does it increase soil structure so water can infiltrate the soil more readily, but it also act, acts like a sponge. So more water can be held within the soil and therefore be, become plant available. So a 1% increase in soil organic carbon in a sandy soil can increase the soil's water holding capacity by up to 30%, which is really important. And these are all due to our soil organisms and processes. So as soil organisms decompose soil organic matter, so as they consume organic matter in the soil, they produce sticky substances which glue soil particles together, which envelop around soil aggregates, if we're talking about um, fungal hyphae. And this is really important for our water holding capacity and our enhanced soil structure as well. So as you can see through this, um, improving soil health and soil organic matter is a really important way to achieve that. It provides a huge amount of ecosystem services, supporting our food and fibre production. Most of our modern medicines have their origins in terms of antibiotics actually in soil. So we're even, we're even doing that too. And it's important for regulating climate change. Now there's a huge opportunity um, that's coming into the market now with soil carbon trading and with co-benefit markets to not only increase productivity through increasing soil organic carbon, but also to diversify on farm incomes. And that's why we're also interested in it. I read a paper the other day and it said, um, by increasing soil organic carbon, the value in terms of production was between 25 and $90 per hectare. And that was in terms of the water and the nutrient value. So it's really important and it's pretty mainstream these days to work on increasing soil organic carbon. So just to recap, so we know that soil organic carbon is dependent on organic matter supply. So it's this balance between the amount of organic matter going into the soil. Now that can either be grown in situ or brought to the site in terms of composts and manures, for example. And it's the balance between supply and the loss. And remember, loss comes from decomposition, which is actually a good thing as well. We need our microbes to be making stable humus and also making nutrients available. Uh, and also the loss from erosion, which still haven't seen an example of where that's ever a good thing, unless perhaps you're downhill from someone's place who's eroding. Um, so we also know that this is going to be modified by two things. The type of organic matter, how vulnerable is it to decomposition, i.e. how tasty is it for more for soil microbes to actually decompose and the soil's capacity to store organic carbon. So that's got to do with the amount of clay. So the amount of chairs in the room, um, the type of clay. So how comfy the chairs are to make sure the nutrients are gonna stay there. Uh, the depth of soil and soil structure as well. So the image that you've got on your screen now, it's pretty damn obvious that on the left-hand side, you've got a soil that's high in carbon, we can see that, we can see that beautiful dark staining of humus throughout the soil. If you could grab a handful of that soil and smell it, you'd smell actinomyces, that beautiful earthy smell. Uh, on the right hand side, this is uphill, so that's not surprising. We've got a soil with a whole lot of potential. Hey, look at that, not a huge amount of carbon there. It's quite a shallow, rocky, sandy profile, so that's gonna limit its potential. But that's an example. You can just eyeball soils which are higher in organic carbon. But then. It's probably not good science just to eyeball stuff. So let's have a look at a graph. What we've got here is some results from a field survey in the Monero region. And I've got three soil types that are listed there. So there's basalt derived soils, high clay, um, shallow granite derived soils, and then deep granite derived soils. Soil scientists always have their graphs upside down. So what we have is our soil surface at the top, then with depth descending, and you'll see the depth descends to 70 centimetres for each of those soil, um, soil profiles that we're looking at. Now there's two different colour lines. They're our introduced pastures and our native pastures, and there was no difference between those. So you can almost ignore that part. What I want you to do is have a look at A, the pattern of carbon throughout the profile. So there was more carbon in our basalt derived soils compared to the shallow granite and the deep granite derived soils. So remember the only thing that's different here is the uh, soil type, not the region, not the climate. So there's more carbon where you have more clay. There's more carbon where you've got a deeper soil profile if you compare the deep granite derived soils to the shallow granite derived soils. Now just focus on the deep granite drive soils for a moment. Now I'm going to introduce a different soil profile. Now we're looking at a different region, 
similar rainfall, but a different rainfall pattern, which is really important, different temperature. And we've got the same soil type. So we're looking at deep granite derived soils in the Monero region compared to the Brewer region. Now there was twice as much carbon in those Monero deep granites compared to the Brewer deep granites. In the Monero region, you've got um, very cold <laughs> winters and you've got quite hot summers. In the Brewer region, you've got this well, usually you've got this equi-seasonal rainfall pattern. So you've actually got, while, while pasture production's quite similar between the two regions, you've got decomposition and microbial activity happening throughout the year in the Brewer region, which is mean that you've got more humus, but a less total amount of organic carbon that's accumulating in that soil profile. So we know that parent material is important. We know that climate's important. Now, those of you who have heard me speak recently, I refer to this as my mega table and I'm happy for anyone to have copies of these slides. Uh, what we've got here on the left hand, on the first column in the left hand side, we've got a range of different management practices. Second column, now we've got the carbon sequestration rate. So remember, this is tons of carbon per hectare per year to 30 centimetres. So the way that we, uh, a rough way of calculating that is you've got your organic carbon percentage, multiplied by the bulk density of the soil. So you've got the concentration of the carbon in the percentage. The bulk density of the soil is the mass of, so is the mass of soil multiplied by the depth. And that's how we get our tons of carbon per hectare. But these are looking at the rates. So per hectare per year, far right hand column, I've gone to my geek space and you've got the references listed there. Now, you can take this table away and have a look at the different practices that increase carbon. And now these I've focused mainly on our New South Wales results. Towards the bottom of the table, I've increased some, I've included some um, Australia-wide results there. Uh, but we're looking at from about half a tonne to one and a half tonnes of carbon per hectare per year through those levers that we can pull, through grazing management, through nutrient management, through pasture rotations, so through including a legume pasture in crop rotations through making sure that we're grazing so that our perennial pastures can set seed, so that our annual legumes have enough sunlight to actually grow and fix nitrogen to supply more biomass. All of these strategies are what we're promoting in terms of good land management, in terms of producing more. If you grow more biomass, you can potentially sequester more carbon. And that's what we're seeing here. Now, what I haven't included in this table, uh, are things like um, sequestration rights from dung beetles, and which is really important um, through bringing organic amendments to the soil, which is also important as well. These are just some examples of where we can increase soil carbon sequestration um, in our farming land. But sometimes the increase might be quite slow and unspectacular. So generally our largest gains in soil organic carbon stocks are in the first five to 10 years after practice change or adoption. And I wanna use this as a quick example. And this is a the, what's called the master trial. It was an 18 year trial. So a long-term trial from a place called Book Book, south of Wagga. And this trial um, was the brilliant work of Mark Conyers, Gwandi Lee and Keith Hellyer and a whole range of other people who worked on this trial. And what I'm presenting here is the organic carbon change after 18 years. So this went from a conventionally cultivated site to a site where pastures were sown. There were annual pastures, um, subclover and rye and perennial pastures, phalaris and coxfoot. Some were limed, some weren't limed. So we're looking at the, the liming influence in just a minute, park that thought. Um, they were all grazed and they all had um, nutrients applied to be at the um, re critical requirement for those pasture types. So now on the x-axis, that's the axis along the bottom, we've got the organic carbon percentage. On the y-axis, again, remember soil scientists means that the soil surface is at the top, that's where zero is, um, going down to a 120 centimetres. T0 is when the trial started, T18 is 18 years on. And we can see that we've increased soil carbon with this practice, going from conventionally cultivated to a perennial or an annual pasture. We can see that most of the change occurred in the topsoil layers, which is what we expect. And we can see that there was about a one, percent increase over those 18 years, okay? Now I've seen quite a few papers lately and I would almost 
I'll say almost confidently, I will confidently say, in the medium to high rainfall zone, I reckon you could get 1% in some of your soils there within five years. And we've seen data to support that. I just got distracted. Okay, so now we're looking at the rotations. Now we're talking about the tonnes of carbon per hectare per year from that site, and it was about half a tonne. And it didn't matter if it was an introduced, sorry, it didn't matter if it was an annual or a perennial pasture. And liming didn't really make a significant difference either for soil carbon. It did, however, increase stocking rate and therefore increase the value of liming from those pastures. So that was an important add on there, but I'm monocular, just focus on soil carbon for this one. Um, so we've got an increase in half a tonne per hectare per year, which is exciting. So we know that pastures are important. We also know that crop and pasture nutrition is important. So there's two parts to this story and I wanna talk about soil nutrition now. The first part is that there's strong correlations between soil organic carbon and a whole range of nutrients. So the graph you can see there, X axis is total nitrogen content, Y axis is the total carbon content. And you can see as you increase total nitrogen, you also got an increase in total carbon. Two reasons for that. First reason I'm talking about here is if your plants have adequate nutrition, then they can grow bigger and healthier. Bigger and healthier plants can put more organic matter potentially back into the soil. That's really important. Just a sidestep here, doesn't matter if the nutrients come from a bag or squeezed out of a chook from an organic source, whatever. The important thing is that the plants have the nutrients to grow. Second graph here, now we've got total carbon on the y-axis and on the x-axis this time we've got available phosphorus. Now remember there's total phosphorus and available phosphorus so that's why it's not as neat a line as you can see with your total nitrogen but we can see generally as you have an increase in total in available phosphorus you also get an increase in total carbon and again now if we look at available sulfur on the x-axis as well. Looks a bit like a shot up road sign from Coba, but you still get that general trend. Increasing nutrients means that you get an increase in total carbon. So more plant growth, greater organic matter supply to the soil. We know that for our grass dominant pastures, they're relying on nitrogen fixed from legumes. And that means that they need phosphorus and sulfur for nodulation for the rhizobia to fix nitrogen, which is really important. But the fun doesn't stop there because there's a part two. Now our soil microbes also need nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur. So just like us, they can't just su survive on carbon. They need a whole heap, a balanced diet, a whole heap of other nutrients as well. Um, so when we talk about our humus, so again, I've come back to the pie chart there, which is the majority of the carbon that's in your soil. It's the dark staining that you get in your soil as well. Um, and it consists of the remains of bacteria, fungi, and other microbes. So it, it consists of microbial detritus uh, and those byproducts. And that's what humus actually is. So the more bugs you have in your soil, the more soil organisms, and the more soil organisms you turn over, the greater your humic pool becomes. And I've already convinced everyone online about the importance of that for soil health and for production. Now, plant material, that mainly consists of carbon. So when we're adding wheat residues, or wheat stubble to the soil, that's really high in carbon, not that high in nitrogen and the other nutrients that they require as well. So if we want to increase humus, which is the stable carbon, it's going to be there for longer, really important for cation exchange capacity, nutrients and water holding capacity. Um, the soil microbes need nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur. So this table is from a good colleague of mine, um, Clive Kirkby. And I'm going to use this to show you about the ratios that I'm talking about. So now we've got carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur represented in the left hand four columns. And the first row we've got there is humus. So for every 1,000 parts of um, carbon in humus, you need 90 of nitrogen, 19 of phosphorus, and 14 in sulfur. This is worldwide. This is if you isolate humus, no matter what soil type you're in across the world, these ratios pretty much hold, uh, which in itself is exciting. Hey, Anyway, um, and then you've got your wheat residues. That's the next line down. So you've got Say for every 1,000 tonnes of carbon that's in your, wheat in your wheat stubble, it's only got 17 kilos of nitrogen, 
two of phosphorus, three of sulfur. So if we want our fungi and our bacteria, which we've got the nutrient ratios of those organisms the next one in those next two rows, if we want them to turn wheat residue, wheat stubble, into humus, they're going to have to get some nitrogen from somewhere, some phosphorus and sulfur as well. And they'll do some of that from the atmosphere and they'll get some of that from the plant available nutrients. So there'll be this momentarily almost competition. But remember, we need those microbes to make other nutrients available as well. So not only do our plants need nutrients, but our microbes also need nutrients as well. So I've just got a couple of slides left and I wanna talk about sometimes when there's no difference. On your screen now, you've got two photos. And if I was going to say, which photo do you reckon would have more carbon in the soil? Left hand side is a set stocked paddock out near Brewarana. Right hand side is a cell grazed paddock on the other side of the fence, okay? And you would think that the right hand side would have more carbon in the soil. But unfortunately, there was no difference, okay? There was no difference in soil organic matter. There was a huge amount of difference in soil function, in soil condition, so soil structure. There were more perennials, there was less erosion, there was more productivity, there was greater water infiltration on the right-hand side. So soil organic matter is important, soil carbon's an important measure, but it's not the only measure. So we've got studies where we've seen no difference between annual and perennial pastures. We've seen no difference between native and introduced pastures. Published no difference between cropping and perennial pastures. And that's that one's really interesting because some people think if you're cropping and compare it to a perennial pasture, then you're going to have less carbon. But if you have a crop that is growing in a healthy soil with the nutrients it needs and the water it needs, then there's no reason to think that it can't supply as much organic matter, if not more, than a degraded or a similar stage pasture. What happens though is when you're not in that crop, you've got to make sure that the soil surface is covered and that we're maintaining micro microbial function as well. Um, and then we've also seen no difference between rotationally and continuously grazed pastures, but I've published papers where we've got greater amounts of carbon under strategically grazed and cell grazed pastures as well. So what's going on in some systems? Why doesn't soil carbon increase despite best management? Now, there could be a few reasons. Now, it could be because of soil type and climate. We know that they are major drivers of net primary productivity. They're also major drivers of decomposition, so that microbial process. It could be due to poor crop and poor pasture nutrition. No matter what management system you look at, there are good and bad examples of all of them. It could be because it's a water limited environment, it could be drought. It could be with most with a lot of pasture systems, this can often be the case in my experience. It's due to spatial variability or large background levels of soil organic carbon. If you imagine you've got two buckets, right? One bucket, I fill completely to the brim with sand and the other bucket's empty. And then I come along with two handfuls of sand. Now, I'm gonna put one of those handfuls in the bucket that's already full of, of sand. I'm going to put the other handful, exactly the same amount, in the empty bucket. Now, if I were to show you those two buckets and say, where did the increase occur? You can't see it in the bucket that's already full of sand, can you? But the one that had no sand in it, you'd see that handful, exactly the same amount, which was added to the buckets, you'd see it in the empty bucket. So if you're starting from a really low baseline, you'll probably detect an increase in soil carbon. If you've already got a huge amount of carbon under your uh, healthy perennial pastures, then detecting that change may take time or it may need to be a greater magnitude to actually detect change there. Um, so just going back to the point that soil organic carbon is my life and it's important metric, but it's not the only metric. So in summary, carbon is already cycling on your farm. I spoke to Abby and Luke earlier about the carbonomics. So where you've got carbon, that's the currency that plants use and they trade this with our soil microbes for goods and services, for nutrients. And that's already happening. To change it, to ch sequester more carbon, in some cases you might need to change practice. And, that's, and there's a lot of information on that out there. But really it comes down to 
thinking about in your paddock, on your blank canvas, what's your biggest lever to pull? Is your productivity and your plant growth limited by soil acidity? Is your nitrogen fixation limited by soil acidity? Because I've already shown you that, that nitrogen is a really important component for, for microbes, but also for plant production. Maybe productivity is limited by compaction, something physical, and that's your biggest lever to pull, or maybe it's nutrition. So it's really important to identify what your biggest lever to change actually is. And that's going to be up to the farmer or for advisors, up to you to actually work out what's limiting. And sometimes there's going to be some soil and climate factors that might limit the sequestration potential. So you need to be smart about it. You pick the right practice for the right place at the right time, and that's going to increase soil organic carbon on your farm. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, let's have a look at what questions we've got here. We do have one here from Darren Fay. Darren asks us, how does this fit with the permanence rules with carbon credits? Huh, cool, all right. Um, so with permanence rule, you need to demonstrate or either a measured or a model change in soil organic carbon, the total soil organic carbon. So the char plus humus plus the label fractions all added together, which is just what you get with your LECO. And you need to commit to that change for either 25 years or 100 years. So remembering that when you get that change, part of it is always turning over in terms of the label carbon. Um, and that's why you usually with the model rate, it can be a bit, a bit conservative. But I guess in summary, permanence means it looks at the whole organic carbon. They don't look at fractions. We know that there's fractions though, and it needs to stay in your soil for 25 to 100 years. And you can trade soil carbon, people do it. There's a measured, method and there's also a modelled method which doesn't require you to take any soil samples. Thanks Suze. Melinda Wales got a question. Yes my question was um, <clears throat> what practices do you need to change to increase this soil organic carbon? Do you mean for trading or do you just mean in general? <clears throat> just in general to increase the carbon in your own soil. I'd, I'm not knowing your background. I'd start by looking at your grazing management and your plant nutrition. Right, so they would okay. be the two things that are most sensible oh, and, and perhaps soil pH if that's limiting. Really it's about lim identifying what is limiting plant growth on your farm or in a particular area. And that right, would okay. really <clears throat> increase soil carbon. And as I said, like, I've set aside the organic amendments, so bringing in composts and manures, which are a really important way to kickstart those microbial processes as well, but I've just kind of parked those for this presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Melinda. We've got a question from Geoffrey Rethus. Yes, do, do, the, do introduce biologicals, the humates, fulvics and uh, some of the other biological agents help with your soil health? Uh, if you, when you introduce any of those products, you're introducing a source of carbon and potentially a source of life. So you would, you are likely to get, um, I guess, I was gonna say, you're likely to get a response. So all products are different. If you're adding carbon to the soil, you can stimulate microbes. That carbon might come in the form of a microbe itself. So you're basically feeding the billions of life that's already in your soil, or you might be introducing a microbe that can survive in the soil and um, assist plant health as well. Different products have different range of effectiveness and I certainly haven't tested them, but if you can get an increase in plant growth, then you're probably gonna get a soil carbon increase too. Um, Suze, there have been webinars that we've had in the past on um, that kind of subject. So if people want to look at the, um, the SNOP webinar, webinars from the past, that might help with that question as well. Good idea. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Suze. Are you happy? Yes, um, to a degree. Um, <laughs> We, we hear a lot about applying urea that's damaging, can be damaging to the biological balance of us. And some suggestions we should be supplying carbon when we supply products like urea. Would you like to comment on that? 
Yeah, I will. So I'll take that in two phases. First of all, when you apply a readily available form of nutrient, what you can do is almost switch off the plant's need to produce the very important and unique root exudates which support those, which, which support microorganisms which might have scavenged for those nutrients anyway. So if, you're, if you've got a high level of available nitrogen, there's no need for the plant to invest energy and responses in terms of um, root exudates to support those microbes which would have fixed nitrogen for you. There's no need for them. They'll change their root exudates because the next thing that might be limiting is pH. So they can like produce exudates which will, which will modify the soil pH within the rhizosphere. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're killing the microbes, but certainly you're changing the function and the balance of that microbial community. And the same is the case with phosphorus as well. Pour on a whole heap of available phosphorus. Well, the plants don't need to support mycorrhizal function which could have got phosphorus for them, they'll start changing their root exudates to support another microbe. Um, now, in terms of adding carbon with it, when you, you what you can potentially do is by stimulating, because remember I said you you feed your mic you feed your plants fertilizers or nutrients, you can also feed your microbes. Now, if the microbes who are sitting there in a carbon limited in a nitrogen limited environment they get a whole heap of nitrogen, they could potentially start to decompose some organic matter in the soil, which may have in otherwise um, been quite stable. So you can actually get this uh, priming effect and a decline in soil organic carbon under some of those high nutrient environments as well. So I think that's where that adding in carbon with your nitrogen for input um, comes in. Thanks, sir. John Troughton. Uh, my yep. question is that Sydney, Sydney University last year had a paper which stated fairly categorically that there was no significant effect of organic matter in soils, including sandy soils. And I'm just wondering whether um, you're aware of that paper, and if so, what might be the explanation? I, I am aware of the paper, and it was no significant effect on water holding capacity, I think. And I, I, do we have a webinar on that, Abby and Luke? I thought we invited well, them along. Yes, yes. yes. you had yes, a webinar on it, yes. Yes, we Just, did, Goody gave a webinar, yep. Oh, great. So I guess you can refer to that. In terms of increasing infiltration, so the water's ability to hold on to, to, sorry, to have a water supply and plant available water, there's a whole lot of work out there that shows that increasing soil organic carbon increases plant available water. So you would support the fact that the water holding capacity of itself was not increased with organic matter? Well, they presented a really strong case for that, but I think plan available water, which is what we're in the business of, um, certainly is increased with increasing in soil organic carbon. But their paper said the wilting point hadn't changed. It wasn't. But the upper limit had changed. So um, the, saturated or uh, field capacity? I they measured saturated. saturated field capacity and wilting point and none of those parameters changed. But I thought the difference between the two had still changed, but I'll need to go back and, and have a look. It's a yeah. take it on notice, thanks. And yeah. I I reckon we can still, we've still got a really strong case for increasing soil organic carbon, increases plant available water, but I do take on board that that was a very strong and topical paper in that space. Thank you. Uh, we've got Ian Packer with his hand up. Sue, so, um, this great um, debate between best management practice and regenerative agriculture. Have you got any comments on those two things? I think there's various forms of regenerative agriculture. And if we take the view that regenerative agriculture is improving soil condition um, through improved soil management, then I'm on board with that. In terms of some of the extremes, I just think that there's not enough evidence at the moment to support some of those those particular views, but certainly if regenerating our soils means improving soil condition through increasing soil organic matter, um, that's that's going to be good for productivity and good for um, carbon sequestration. Yeah, agreed. And it depends how you do it. It's interesting, you also, another one, um, you're looking at the, the levers and where limits are. I've been working just out the road with a fellow who had massive soil compaction and subsurface acidity and it's, he's going to go nowhere unless he gets on top of them. 
Yeah, yep. And it's different for everyone. And no one, as you know, no one knows their paddocks better than the farmers themselves. And it just takes some clever diagnostic to say, right, that's what we need to change. And you'll get it. That's where you'll get your first increase in soil organic matter. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. And we've got uh, Ian Chapman as well. Go yeah. ahead, Dean. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, it's just, um, you know, there's lots of different forms of grazing that get yeah. sort of compressed, if you like, into the terminology of rotation or, or strategic grazing. And you know, for the slide that you put up earlier, I'd, I'd love to sort of get a bit more detail on what, um, um, what was actually used in, in this case. Okay, and um, and I completely agree. It's kind of a frustration of mine because you can. Here we go. I'll get back to this. This is the slide you'll see in a moment that I'm assuming that you're talking about. Um, so for my work, when I've spoken about strategic and rotational um, grazing, we said strategic grazing was where we allowed the um, perennial pastures to set seed. Um, so we actually removed stock then. So it was strategic in terms of pasture response, but also um, so that the legumes could get sunlight to, for the annual legumes there. Um, rotational grazing, uh, some of that work was done out west. So it's looking at TGP fencing and removing or managing the amount and grazing intensity in some parts of the landscape. And I'm happy to send you those papers, but I agree that sometimes rotational cell and strategic grazing get used interchangeably. And really it's just about having managed grazing pressure compared to um, continuously grazed pastures where perhaps what livestock are grazing isn't managed. Thank you. And, I, and on that, I just think particularly out west, but there's cases for it here, livestock are actually livestock grazing, well-managed livestock grazing is a really important part of the solution to improving soil condition in terms of the role they can play in pasture response and pasture composition and their dung and urine as well. That's good, thanks. Thanks, Ian. The Ian's are done well. Two out of the four Ian's attending have asked a question. So from Western Australia, we've got Tim. Yeah, I hope I, I'm working from here from uh, over in Western Australia. Great presentation, Susan. Really appreciated what you've uh, put forward in a in a in a in a great um, uh, layout of information that reaches multiple audiences. I often go to a lot of presentations and seminars that talk about uh, terra, uh, terra preta and the idea that uh, soil can constantly grow carbon as if it's a, a linear model. Whereas a lot of the work that I've been involved with, with Dan Murphy and Fran Hoyle over here in the West, it's more like an exponential. There's just, there's a point where the soil just cannot push any more carbon in. And I'm, I'm really just interested in your pers your perspective about yeah. that, because it's, I guess if, if in the whole carbon trading model, it assumes that you're going to constantly be putting carbon into, into your soil. But, but over, over to you, Susan. Okay, thank you. Um, so the model that they use in soil car in the trading actually does have that tapering off effect. So you get the biggest change after practice in the first five to 10 years, and that's the model. And then it um, continues at a decreasing rate with time. And I agree, under most systems, that that's what you'll see. And for most systems, what you can grow in situ is really limited by sunlight, heaps of that, carbon dioxide, stacks of that, uh, nutrients, and then water. So you've got this limit to how much you can keep growing. And then you've also got decomposition happening. If you could keep applying carbon and keep applying nutrients, we've got work that shows that you can overcome that upper limit. So there is no saturation. You just keep accumulating humus in your soil, but that requires a lot of nutrients and a lot of carbon continually. So I don't think it would, it's not necessarily practical in broad acre systems, but we can do it in a pot in the lab. Um, so I agree, it's not linear, and generally it's gonna come limited down to water and nutrients. Uh, yes. You know, thanks for that. I, I think it's almost the utopian system. Uh, I'm really thankful that you've, you've said that, that um, but there is, there must be an upper limit, you know, because uh, 
you know, if you add lime, you're going to be mm -hmm. increasing your microbial activity that's going to be eating your um, uh, organic matter and, and so on and so forth. So the system is, is quite variable. But um, anyway, yeah. no, good. thanks. No worries. And I guess what we can just take heart in is if we can continually continue to accumulate humus in the soil, so that kind of microbes and microbial products, then that's the carbon that stays there for longer. And that's the carbon that we can kind of, that it's more chemically protected in terms of its just natural state. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so before I go to this uh, or a question for a paper, I'm just going to read out to you a quick comment. Um, Jerry McEwen has said, fantastic, clear and comprehensible explanation. Thank you in uh, capital letters. I just thought I'd pass that on. Oh, uh, now, Tony Hill has, uh, has asked, I'd like a copy of the rotational grazing papers and the slides. Now, I yep. just thought maybe you could so perhaps slowly sort of give people time to write down. I don't know if you'd be able to write it onto a PowerPoint slide or not, but you might be able to list the perhaps the, the, the rotative, rotational grazing papers you consider of well, most importance. If my if you write down anyone who's interested in a copy of the slides and particular papers, if you identify them, um, write down my email address and just send me an email. That might be the best. Yep. Hey Luke, do you reckon? No. Sure. Yeah. And sure, just noting, that. this is just noting that there's still 73 people online. One thing that I wanted to say that I didn't is as a scientist, we need to be really careful that our quest for evidence doesn't stand in the way of innovation because what I'm seeing more and more is this really innovative practitioner movement to increase soil condition and increase soil organic matter. And sometimes I can't explain how, and they're far more innovative and clever than I ever will be. And you can't unsee some of the things you see in paddocks. And so I really do hope that evidence is important and making sure something's replicated is important. And if you're gonna make a change that you're not sure about, either leave a strip so you can compare it or just do a strip if it's going to be expensive because it doesn't matter how healthy your soil is if you go broke doing it. Um, but certainly there's so much innovation out there that doesn't have a huge amount of numbers behind it yet that I think will kind of be groundbreaking, excuse the pun, stuff going forward in terms of soil carbon sequestration. Thanks, Suze. I can't see any other questions coming in, Suze. Done an absolutely fantastic job and, and congratulations on breaking the record for our webinars. And so thanks a lot again, Suze. And no worries, uh, we'll thanks everyone. Leave it there. Thank you for listening to this Soils Network of Knowledge webinar. Remember the New South Wales DPI Soils Unit facilitates other parts of the community of interest around soils through our Twitter account and the quarterly newsletter All the Dirt. If you'd like to access these, you can use the information that's on your screen now. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to the webinars so that you receive your monthly invitation to the free webinars and you can choose to register. If you've missed a webinar and want to catch up, there are two ways you can do this. Firstly, through the New South Wales DPI YouTube channel where you can access the fully edited and transcribed recordings of the webinars. And if you can't wait for that, there are unedited versions on the GoToStage platform as well. And the information for those is also on your screen now. Thank you very much for your interest in SNOC and we really hope to see you online in the future.